What? Doesn't sound like I'm driving anywhere. Isn't that fun? Okay, last time I came to you, I was in the car. I was very angry at a lot of people. But I'm fine now. I'm fine. I got it all out. And I'm going to tell you a heartwarming story. Stay tuned. You're going to love it. You're going to fucking love it. So I'm at work, right? I know. This is like... This is like... Newman's show. Does anyone know who Newman is? Does anyone remember Newman from Seinfeld? I think I prefer him to Cliff Clavin. Depending on the day, some days I prefer Cliff Clavin. Sometimes I'm my favorite mailman. For example, I deliver to an apartment building. Hold on to your hats, okay? This is gonna this is gonna get intense. You're not gonna believe it. I really hate my route right now. I hate my fucking route so badly. And I had it so good for so long that this is just agony. I just dread going to work because it's just awful. I mean, I love my job on the whole. I just don't like this route. And how, you may ask, did I end up with this fucking stupid route? Well, let me tell you about it. I have a friend. She's a very nice young lady. She's going through some terrible times. Her mom's not well. Her sister-in-law also not well, all at the same time. Very nice young lady. Like her very much. She is the kind of religious person that I think all religious people should be. She's just kind and non-judgmental and doesn't like try to shove Jesus down your throat. Not sexually, calm down. I didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. Point being, we kind of do this thing at work. Every three years, we do like a volume count. They count up all your parcels and packets and all your letters and all your fucking dumb shit that you do every day. And then they rejig all the roots so none of them resemble really what they were before which is really annoying, which is fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. So we all kind of pick again in order of seniority. So this nice young lady who's had these troubles always picks terrible roots. And I don't know why she does it. She just does it. And she's higher in seniority than me, so she picks before me. This is going to get crazy. So she's about to pick this route, the route that I'm on now. She's about to pick it. And the route I want is on a completely different shift. So I says to this young lady, I says, don't take that route. Look at how long it is and how awful it is. You're going to be out there for five million fucking years. Don't pick it. Don't pick it. Because in my brain, I'm already on my other route because no one wants it. No one's chosen it yet. And there's only, what, three people ahead of me? What could possibly go wrong? She's like, you know what? I'm going to take your advice. And I said, you should, because you always pick terrible fucking routes. And so she did. And she took that route. And do you know what the two people ahead of me picked? The only two routes I fucking wanted. So now I'm stuck. (laughs) I spent the beginning of that day talking this nice young lady out of a terrible route. And I spent the rest of that evening talking myself into a terrible route. The same route. The one I tried to talk her out of is the one I ended up taking. And let me see. Tuesday, after a long weekend, I had 101 scannable items plus a fuck ton of mail. Which is insane. Like FedEx. I caught a FedEx guy one time around Christmas, and I was overworked and exhausted, as I am every Christmas, because tis the fucking season, and I've always hated fucking Christmas. I mean, I do a heavy sigh here. (sighs) So the FedEx guy, I can't remember, maybe pure later, I'm not sure. I went up to him, and I'm like, hey, dude, like, how many, how many packages do you have today? Like, what is your workload right now? He's like, oh, I have about 110. And if he said 110, he's really got 100. So I'm just like, I think I had 89 that day and I'm like, and I got to fucking walk like six hours on top of doing all those things. Like, fuck, man, that's just brutal. Wah, wah, wah. Cry, cry, cry. Whatever. I have a good job. I like it. I can't wait to get the fuck off this route. And that's the good thing about my job is if you don't like where you are, you can move somewhere else. So it's kind of great. You're not ever stuck anywhere for any length of time. But the cool thing about this route, it's a lot of businesses. And sometimes I get in sync (laughs) with, I'm sorry to laugh, but I just think this is so fucking funny. I get in sync. So there's me, I'm with the Canada post truck. Then there's the FedEx lady. And then there's the UPS lady. And I'm going to venture a guess purely based on the FedEx lady's magnetism. Like she's just got this raw animal magnetism. She's maybe 55. She's got salt and pepper hair, twinkly blue eyes, this beautiful smile. And I just, I'm assuming she's a lesbian because she's got like a very 
Like, I could be seduced by this woman. I'm not into, like, butchy women. But this chick, if she looked at me the right way, I swear to God, I, I would marry her. If she asked, I would marry her, hands down, 100%. One lesbian. I'm on this route. Canada Post. Another lesbian. The UPS lady. I'm just making assumptions. Okay, she's got short hair. She looks really good in a baseball cap. She can reverse that giant truck on a dime. And it is amazing. Okay? And she also... I'm assuming lesbian. So I figure if the three of us ever end up in the same fucking room, something truly mundane will happen. I just can picture the three of us putting our hands in the middle on top of each other. Power of accurate stereotypes. Yay! And then we'd all have a deliver a box to the same place, same time. It just, all right, so, <clears throat> I, I understand, it's only amusing to me, uh, deliver, okay, let's take note, uh, stereotype jokes, uh, not funny, uh, talking about work, also not funny, okay, big check mark on that information, good to know, let's move on, shall we, so, what I want to tell you, this heartwarming tale of me doing an excellent job and being appreciated, here we go, I delivered to an apartment building, and you know what's funny to me? Uh, my good friend Rose, I don't know if you guys remember, Rose used to submit uh, very exciting, interesting stories as opposed to this one. She is confounded by the fact that in Winnipeg, there are apartment buildings where you have to go to the top floor to deliver the mail and everyone has a mail slot in their door. Like not every apartment, I think it's more of a rarity, but they exist. So I told her that one of my jobs is to go to the top of a five-story building and deliver mail all the way around all the way around to the bottom till you get to the first floor. And that is amazing to her. I don't really know that I'd want to live in a building like that because basically anyone can lift up your mail flap and look into your apartment at any given time, which kind of makes me uncomfortable. I'd much rather go to a panel. But you do get to meet some interesting characters. So having said that, I deliver to an apartment. This woman is sometimes home, sometimes not. And she orders a lot of stuff, which is fine. Order a lot of stuff. Please allow me. Allow me. That's the, did I tell you that's titled my memoirs? Yeah, I may have mentioned that. So anyway, I catch this. I catch this woman. She's like, "Oh, is that my train?" And I was like, "No, that was yesterday. That was a massive box." And she just looked kind of terrified. And I was like, "You weren't home yesterday, right?" No, no, I wasn't home. Okay. How big is the box? And I said, "That's what she said." And that did not go over well. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that, but I did think it. Point being, she's a little old lady, and I said, "Okay." I will see if I can re-deliver that for you. So, not a big deal. And I did, in fact, get permission. I signed out the package. I re-delivered the package. The package. I re-delivered the package, and she, like, clutched her pearls. She was so touched that I would go the extra mile for her. And she said thank you about 4,000 times. So there are people out there that aren't fucking monsters. They exist, and they're thankful, and they're kind. And I just wanted to make sure that I told you a story that didn't end with me, like, you know, shaking my fist and yelling at people. See, I'm a human. I'm a human. You may be wondering why I'm recording this. Where did I find the time? How did I do that? Why am I in this tiny little room screaming at no one? Well, I've been up since five with diarrhea. My bowels are like, hey, hey, you sleeping? Trying to sleep there? Hey, tossing and turning. Why don't you get up? It's time to poop. Yep, it's about an hour early, but time to poop. Let's roll. And you know what? When you're bowel, you better get the door. You know what I'm saying? So I went down to the bathroom, had a poop. It was glorious. I'll tell you all about No, I won't. What I was supposed to do today... Oh, oh. Ooh, you heard it here first. That's what happens when you record in a teeny tiny room. <laughs> That's about right. Anyway, what I was supposed to be doing today, uh, my mom's supposed to go for this procedure where they put like this thin little thing through an artery in your groin and it's supposed to like cauterize part of her heart. It sounds pretty gruesome. And then the pacemaker will take over so my mom's heart isn't like basically running a marathon constantly because they can't control her heart rate. And that was supposed to happen today. And you're like, oh, past tense. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So we get there. Get She's all dressed, ready to go, which like shocked me, but she was like... Raring to go, and then my sister, 
not Janice, had the genius idea of calling this clinic and being like, hey, just wanted to check if you guys are running on time. And they're like, Ooh, call back in an hour. We're not running on time. Things are behind. So great. And I take that opportunity to put like this heat tape around my mom's pipes that always freeze. Real lesbian-like activity. I tell you about it, but no one fucking cares. And then we get a call back at around 11.30, and we were supposed to be there at 11.30. Oh, yeah. Uh, our machinery broke, so we're going to have to go ahead and reschedule. Uh, and, you know, I did the typical thing where I was like, oh, are you serious? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Uh, our machinery broke. It's kind of out of our control. Like, yeah, I know. And I was like, oh, man, I took a day off work for this. Oh, well, sorry. I mean, we'll have to reschedule. And I'm like, yeah, great, because I have like fucking five sick days left and I have two little kids and myself and my mom's like fucking five million years old. So, yeah, that'll work out fine. So it just was like such a fucking annoying, like anxiety riddled day for nothing. My poor mom's starving. She's like, oh, I want to eat something. And we're like, you can't eat anything because if you throw up, you could choke on your own vomit. Oh, you're going to believe them? It's like, yeah, I'm going to believe the fucking cardiologist over the woman with the fucking grade five education who doesn't believe she has a heart condition or like, you know, fucking diabetes. So yeah, okay. Like, could you not eat? I don't know. She was happy. She was like, the warden called and the execution was off. That's what she felt like. She got out of the electric chair. Yada, yada, yada. The kids aren't here. Why? Because Sarah's parents are wonderful and awesome and kind and generous and lovely. And they offered to help. Today, because I was supposed to take my mom to get electrocuted, according to her. Because uh, we like attention, apparently. And uh, that's where the kids are. And they kept up the end of the bargain. I was like, you know, I'll go get the kids. Like, give your parents the night off. But they were like, no, you know, we want to spend time with them. And I was like, you do. Okay, good fucking luck with that. And I'm sure they're very well behaved at Grandma and Grandpa's house. I'm sure they don't fight and scream and kick and, like, hit each other constantly at Grandma and Grandpa's house, right? No? Okay. So I've got a couple daycare stories for you. The first one involves a little punk kid named Gravy, according to Stella. And Gravy threatened to punch Stella's mama in the face. And now I know what you're thinking. Well, having a lot of people threaten to punch you in the face, what's so special about Gravy? Nothing really. I think Gravy's some kind of special needs kid. <laughs> That's not... <laughs> <clears throat> Poor Gravy. The point being, I had to have an interaction with the very lovely upward inflection lady at the daycare. Hi. Yes, we've had a serious incident. Um, one of the children threatened your physical well-being? And I'm just like, uh-huh. Well, one of the children told Stella that he was going to punch you in the face? And I'm just like, okay. I'm like, is this, is this a serious conversation we're having right now? Because I'm not sure. Yes, it was very serious. Stella told him that if he punched you in the face, that she was going to punch him in the face and it's like well fair's fair i mean like like bring it gravy i i want to watch stella smash you in the fucking face like over and over and over and over and over again but the point is she went to my defense and i'm pretty proud and i'd like to play you a little interview i did with the stella nader about this incident hold please what did gravy say what did he say? He said something not nice. He said something not nice? What's this kid's name? Gravy. Yeah? What did he say to you? He said, you're not nice. Hmm. Why is office? Um, did, no, did, did, did he say something mean? Yeah. What did he say? He said, he's gonna punch you. He said he's going to punch your mama? Yeah. What did he say exactly? He punched mommy and mama. In the face? Yeah. Oh, should I be scared? I punched him. Yeah? Then he punched after me. He punched me. Yeah? Can you say, mama said, knock you out? Mama said, knock you out. Ah, I'm so proud. 
No one's going to fuck with the Stellinator. And if they do, they're going to be fucking sorry. Period. End of story. So the other daycare story I have is also stupid. And quite pointless, too. Oh, and, you know, whatever. If you're into points, then go listen to a good podcast. Otherwise, stick around. You know, you're going to love it. The daycare hires these young women during the summer. Like, I don't know if it's for, like, a practicum or if they're just students or whatever. But it's so darling to see them because they're, like, maybe... Maybe, maybe like 16 to like 19 years old. And you can tell they've had a lot of uh, education, sorry, but not a lot of practical uh, experiences with children. My point being, there was one day that I just ran my chubby ass right off. And I got to the daycare early thinking, oh, great, my kids will be so happy that I got there early. When in fact... Stella was very upset, which is kind of a good thing. It means like, hey, they're having a good time at daycare and they don't want you there because you're a boring, sweaty, chubby loser and they're ashamed of you. Just kidding. Those years are still to come and I can't wait until my kids are ashamed of me and they don't want to be seen with me and they don't want to spend every fucking possible waking moment with me. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, well, when it comes down to it, I may be sad and have some kind of weird empty nest thing going on but right now that sounds heavenly anyway point being i get there sweaty and i'm just happy to pick my kids up and go home and have a hot shower because i hate a sweaty bra i hate sweat socks i hate sweaty underwear i just hate being sweaty and at that time of the year you're just sweaty it's just what it is Winnipeg is either freeze your fucking ass off and then there's a good two weeks in between somewhere that's not bad and then you just fucking freeze. We had a snowstorm Thanksgiving weekend in Canada. Like, that's not nice. That is not nice at all. Fuck off. Okay. Enjoy your life in California. Yes, I know. I know. And I could move there at any time if I wanted to, except, no thank you. You know. No offense, but yeah, no, I just, no, thank you. Thoughts and prayers, okay? Point being, uh, if I can tell one story at a time, I get to this daycare, yada, yada, yada. Stella is throwing an absolute fucking exorcist fit, rolling around on the carpet. I don't want you here. I want to stay longer. And I'm like, oh, I can leave and come back. Yeah, leave. And I'm like, well, that, I didn't mean that. I'm not going to fucking leave and come back. Get in the fucking car. And she's rolling around and she's screaming and like, like, like literally pounding her fists and feet into the mat. And I was like, oh, fuck's sakes. Because everyone's staring at me, right? Because like, oh, yeah, she'd rather stay here with virtual strangers than go home with you. Which is basically true. That's basically what happened. So I feel kind of embarrassed. And I'm also kind of like angry and sweaty. And I just want to get the fuck out of there and go home and have a shower, like I said. So this nice young lady... Twinkle in her eye, she's maybe 18, comes over, and I can see that she's going to school me on how to parent my child. I can see it. I know what she's doing. Her body language is that of superiority. And I'm like, okay. So I stand back and I cross my arms and I'm like, all right, let's see what you're going to do here. And she gets down on, on her knee to get to eye level. She's like, Stella, honey, it's time to go home. And Stella stopped for a second and she stared at her gave her a second, let that sink into her little brain, and then proceeded to cry and scream like twice as fucking loud. And I looked at the 18-year-old the and I'm like, aw, did they teach you that? Did you think getting down on one knee was going to fix this whole situation? You're so cute. Yeah. Okay. I just smiled at her and she just looked up at me and shrugged her shoulders like, well, I don't know. That's what they told us to do. It's like, yeah, I know. It should have worked, but... In all actuality, you didn't stand a fucking chance. They're there. They're there. So I just had to, like, basically drag her out of their screaming. It was, it was a real treat. It was a great feeling. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Okay, well, I think that's about that. Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate you sticking it out with me. You've turned a really stressful, anxiety-filled day into a pleasant, quiet afternoon in a tiny little closet. And I almost got knocked out by a fluorescent light that I'm not entirely sure why I have. Whatever. You know. Hashtag blessed. Okay, um, if you want to send me an email, 
change of address 16 on gmail.com. I have to change that. I don't know why I thought that was so funny when I started this show and I was 34 then and I'm 40 now. I said it. Four zero. Forty years old. I've recently had a birthday. And, you know, I guess I'm okay with being 40. I thought I would be more upset or something, but you know what? It's okay. Life is a journey, not a destination. We're here for a long time, not a good time, or something to that effect. I don't know. Regrets? Yeah, I've got a lot of regrets. I feel terrible a lot of the time about previous behavior, and even behaviors I have right now. But what are you going to do? I, I listened to Sarah Silverman on the Al Franken podcast, and she was talking about um, previous works of hers, and she's like, it's cringy. She cringes when you, and I feel the same way. Like I listen to some of my old episodes every once in a while, like just like, what the hell was I doing when I first started this show? And I listen back and I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Cause you know what? And she said it on the show and she's like, you know what? If you don't cringe, then you're not learning and you're not growing. You're not changing. If you listen to something you said 10 years ago, you should cringe. Cause if you don't, then you're not evolving. You're not changing. You're just kind of the same fucking idiot you were 10 years ago. And somehow you'll never change. And that's that to me is sad. Being stagnant is sad. Changing, regretting, all parts of growing up and growing older, I feel like. You're enjoying your day, everything's going your way. Then along comes Debbie Downer. Always there to tell you about a new disease. A car accident or killer bees. We beg her to spare you, Debbie, please. But you can't stop Debbie Downer. You're welcome. Anyway, point being, email changeofaddress69 at gmail.com. And, you know, I just, I just fucking hate Facebook. I have this friend. This is such a typical Facebook monstrosity type situation. I have a friend. She's recently engaged and she's just a really good person. Sometimes I'm going to tell you some stories that are going to make you think she's not a great person, but... I think in real life, if shit hit the fan, she would be there for me. And that's the important thing. Who she is on Facebook, although annoying, is not who she is in real life. Having said that, I'm going to tell you a little tale. Uh, she got engaged and we have been friends since, I think, like grade nine. And that was like a literal lifetime ago for some of you. She So she got engaged and she sent me a text uh, asking me to be in her wedding party and I just like I guess you're supposed to clamor to want to do shit like that like our normal women pumped and like hey yeah sure let me come and wear an ugly fucking dress that doesn't fit me well and ugly shoes and spend like I don't know a thousand dollars on your wedding when I can't even really afford my own wedding I just I said no <laughs> I know that's terrible but I was just like I know like that is my worst fucking nightmare and she just kind of got super defensive. And I'm like, no, listen, I care about you very much. I'll do whatever I can to support you. And she writes back, like what? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm sure you're going to be like super obnoxious and have a fucking social that I'm either going to have to sell tickets for or donate a prize to. Yes, don't worry. She's already told me that I either have to sell tickets or donate a prize to this fucking social. So that's going to cost me, mm, I'm going to say about 150 bucks already. And, uh... And then she's like, well, you don't have to be in the wedding party if you don't want to. Although, you know, you could wear a dress for me. And I'm just like, okay, no. Like, we'll wear a suit then. Uh, I'm still going to have to say no. Okay, then you have to make a speech. It's like, oh my God, dude. Like, have we never met? Like, do you not know me at all? I told you I don't want to be, like, the center of attention and, like, have people stare at me. Like, I don't know. I don't want to. So the same girl had adopted a cat and then the cat you know scratched her furniture which is what fucking cats do it's just so anyway she gives that cat away and then i heard her well i saw her on facebook adopt another cat about a year later and then i've never heard about the cat again so i'm like okay and then she adopts this black lab sweet little puppy and you know puppies are like babies they're fucking annoying they don't sleep uh they're generally assholes they piss and shit everywhere like Max the dog, the very expensive dog, is what, 11? Is he going to be 12 soon? And yeah, he's still, like, he has to wear a belly band around my house because he will piss everywhere. And he 
thank you, Jesus, did not want to leave my mom's house today. And I've never been happier because if it's not Stella fucking waking me up, it's the fucking dog. And he just like will lay there at three o'clock in the morning, just start licking his paw. He's just licking his paw, just having a little lick, just bored in the middle of the night. And sometimes he'll get up and he'll go downstairs and inevitably shit somewhere. And it's always, uh, did he shit, find the shit in the morning? It's just like brutal. Anyway, point being, she gets this black lab and I texted Sugar and I'm like, Sugar, I guarantee you this dog will be gone within a month. And lo and behold, that dog, of course, piss and shit everywhere, chewed up her shoes because black labs need a lot of fucking exercise and they're basically like babies. And then the last straw, I guess, for that girl was uh, this dog peed on her leather couch. And I'm like, okay. Next morning. Oh, we're so heartbroken to find out that my daughter is allergic to dogs. Sure, Jan. Whatever. And she sells the dog. That dog didn't last one fucking week. Like, come on, man. Don't, don't do that. That's not cool. She ended up finding, I'm assuming, a good home for the dog. She sold it for the 500 bucks she put into it. But I was just like, you just don't like pets. Maybe you need to realize that you don't like pets. You don't like cats. You don't like dogs. Buy a fucking goldfish. Just, anyway. Point being, I am not going to be in her wedding party. I will go to her wedding. Her wedding will inevitably cost me a shit ton of money. And that's what annoying friends are. <sighs> and that's why I hate Facebook. Is because if it wasn't for all this, I wouldn't even know about her dog and her boyfriend, who she's dated for a year and is now engaged to, who she used to shit talk about how he wanted to move in with her so fast. And he's jealous that she has a male massage therapist. Like, I don't know. I just see red flags everywhere with her and she just doesn't see them. So I'm just like, okay, well, you know what? You're a little bit older than me. Go ahead. Have at her. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm really hoping that they don't make it to the wedding so I don't have to fucking go to it. Oh, and the best part... She's planned her wedding for a Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. And then she wrote on Facebook, well, if people can't come, they can take the day off work. And if they can't take the day off work, the reception starts at 6. And no kids allowed. Oh, okay, cool. So I have to waste a fucking personal day to come to your fucking wedding because you were too cheap to have it on a Saturday night when everyone could go. And I have to find someone or inevitably pay someone to watch my kids. Like, wow, that's really awesome of you. So glad. Thank you so much for the uh, burden. I mean, invitation. You know, whatever. Potato, potato. Womp, womp. Okay, so Facebook sucks. I just, I want to delete my account. <sighs> I think it would greatly improve my life. But I just can't do it. Like, what did we do without Facebook? It's virtually useless, right? Like, it's just, it's just me quietly hating someone I've known my whole life. That I wouldn't hate if it wasn't for Facebook. Ah, whatever. Yada, yada, yada. Oh, I do I do want to talk about one thing really quickly. I don't know if you guys remember... Uh... Uh, I don't know if I want to open this kettle of fish. Okay, I won't. I have a lot of feelings. There are a lot of feelings in this tiny little room full of garbage. Um, I lost a good friend this year. Uh, 2019 can suck a bag of cocks. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. My mom was sick a shit ton. It's just terrible. And while we were in Victoria, uh, this past spring break, my friend Buster passed away. And I feel so bad about it. I still feel terrible. <clears throat> he was just one of those kind of guys, always there for me, always there to help. Just so nice. Okay, I just was really lucky to know him. And if you listen back to previous episodes, and I think if you listen to Return to Sender, the old podcast I did, he was always very supportive and very nice. I was lucky to have him, and maybe someday I can go into that, but I just feel a lot of feelings still. It's still pretty raw. I just miss him so much. And the funny thing is, he knew about the dime thing, right? Uh... <laughs> I'm crazy. Okay, what kind of crazy are you? I'm crazy that I think my deceased father is leaving me a trail of dimes to find. So every time I find one, I take a picture and obnoxiously post it on Facebook. I guess I don't post every single one I find, but when I feel like I've been stressed out, like I have been stressed out about this thing, heart thing that my mom's going to have to do for weeks now, 
because I've known about it for weeks. And boom, this week I found two, I think. I only posted one, but I found two. Which usually tells me, hey, chill out, buddy. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going in the right direction. You're going to be fine. Everything's going to work out. So I just really needed to find them. And there they were. And I'm always grasping at what's on the other side. You know, like, what are we all hurtling towards? And I know a lot of people think they're atheists. There's nothing there. It's like the end of The Sopranos. You go black and that's it. And I get that. And you own that. And those are your feelings. And I don't know if it's like just that part of my brain that can't accept that everything just ends, that I think these dimes are some kind of meaningful thing. But I'll tell you what, uh, Buster died March 27th. And I was in one of the most beautiful places I have ever been, uh, the Fisherman's Wharf down um, in Victoria. And it's just cool. It's just like a wharf. You know, there's like boathouses and little shops. And I got a text from his sister saying, hey, have you heard from Buster? And I'm like, no. And she said, well, we've been trying to call him for a few hours now and he's not answering and it's out of character for him. And I thought, oh, okay. Uh, well... I'm in Victoria, like I can't get in. Because of course he locked his gate because his <laughs> he, he used to have the cops and like chicken delivery guys and pizza delivery guys come to his house thinking it was the street over. So he used to lock his gate because he didn't want people coming to his house. So they couldn't get into his house to check on him because uh, the gate was locked and they're kind of older so they can't just jump a fence. And I'm like, look, I'm in Victoria. I'm sorry. I can't be of any help really. And she's like, okay, I'll keep you posted. And I just had this awful feeling like this foreboding, soul-crushing anxiety. And uh, we were at the wharf and everybody got fish and chips because it's like just so good and so fresh and delicious. And the halibut there is amazing. And I just didn't want it. It made me feel sick to my stomach. So about an hour and a half after that initial text, I'm just kind of pacing and we're with the kids at the park and there's an obnoxious English woman there yelling at her kids and... uh and then I get the text that tells me that um, Buster has passed away. Ugh. That was rough. We were on the boat. There's like a little ferry you can take. And my kids are having a great time. And they're on a boat. And I just, I just want to get in the fetal position and cry. But I can't. Because... I'm a mom, and we're on the fucking ferry, and we're on vacation, and it's not cool for your kids to see you cry, because it'll make them sad, and it's just awful, I just, oh, it's just awful. I tried to hold it together, sometimes I just lag behind and just, you know, feel some feelings or whatever, and march along, and you know, I tell some stories about Stella that she's you know, rough and tumble and don't fuck with her. She'll cut you. And, you know, she's a boxer and all this stuff. But I was putting her to bed that night and I kept telling myself, like, just get through this book, put her to bed, and then you can, like, curl up and, like, cry as much as you want. Have at her. But I couldn't. I just couldn't hold back anymore. I just... I just started crying. And I'm reading her this book. And I kept thinking about the night before. And the night before, I should say the day before, we got up at four because that's six o'clock Manitoba time. And it was a rough fucking day. Like the kids were just fighting nonstop and Stella was screaming and she wasn't listening. And it was just one of those days that just makes you want to fucking like rip your hair out. And uh, Buster messaged me asking how we were, how the kids were, how Victoria was, what the weather was like, how I was. And I just thought, I, I'm so exhausted. I can't. I can't write him back right now. I just couldn't. I was just exhausted. It was just a brutal day. So I thought to myself, I'll write him back in the morning. Uh, and we got up again at like 4 or 4.30, 6 or 6.30 Manitoba time. And we went to Bouchard Gardens and it was lovely. And... I wrote him back probably, I think, around 9.30. Because I didn't want to wake him up in case he had his little chime on or whatever. So I wrote him back that Victoria's great. We're having a great time. I asked him how he was doing. And shortly after that, Malcolm finds a dime. 
And I was like, okay, cool. That's nice. I love when he finds them. It makes me feel lovely. And Buster never got that uh, message. He passed away before he checked it. And I know that because when I look, there's still the check mark there. Because he never read it. So I basically didn't write back to him the last chance I had. So I'm putting Stella to bed that night and I'm reflecting on all this stuff and I just feel terrible. Like, just terrible. Tears are streaming down my face. I'm reading a book to her and she looks over at me and she's like, Mama, why are you sad? And she's like wiping my tears away. Don't be sad, Mama. It's okay. So yeah, she's a Terminator inside, but she's also very thoughtful and caring and empathetic and kind. So there's that. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I didn't realize this was so, like, fresh for me. It's still very difficult. Um, okay, so the point I was trying to make is that I'm a superstitious wackadoo. And when we got back, I think it was April Fool's Day when I went back to work. And it's cold in Winnipeg. April Fool's. It's very cold. And there's still a little bit of snow on the ground. Like, it's warming up, but it's not that warm. And i walking along, and I kick up some leaves, and up comes a butterfly. And I'm like, what the fuck? I've never seen a butterfly when there's snow on the ground, ever. I can't remember, in especially not the very beginning of April. So I just think about it. I take a picture of it. Buster knew he was sick. He didn't know with what, and I was trying. He's a he was a stubborn son of a bitch. Like, if you think of how stubborn my mom is, and then just put it in a male form, like, you know that meme that says, like, 50,000 men will die of stubbornness this year, and then somebody spray paints, no, we won't. That's Buster. You, you can't make Buster do fucking anything, because he just won't. And I was trying to coax him into going to a doctor, and uh, he did go to a couple walk-ins. He got some blood work. He went for his CT scan a couple days before, and I think he was to get the results the day that he passed away. I don't want to get into it too much because I want to be respectful of his privacy. But he mentioned to me that he would like Sugar, she's been on this show before, Sugar, to have his cat, Louie. So Sugar's like, all aboard, no problem. So when he passed away, Sugar got Louie, the cat. And I texted Sugar, I'm like, I just saw a butterfly in the beginning of April. She's like, holy shit, I just saw a butterfly. And I was like, wait, what? Look, coincidence, maybe. Do I want to just think it was Buster saying, hey guys, I'm okay. I'm over here. Everything's fine. Yeah, I need to think that. Probably coincidence, but my little pea brain needs to think that he's okay. That his energy has gone somewhere. Like he's left his body, but his energy is still around. I need to think that. I miss him. Every day, I think about him. Every day. Like, three, four times a day, and I laugh. Because he was hilarious. Like, his life philosophies are now my life philosophies. You know? Just too funny. So there's the butterfly thing. And I've also been randomly finding quarters since he passed away. And I'm sure it's just me manifesting more bullshit to soothe my tiny little fucking reptile brain. But I don't care. It makes me feel better. I find one and I laugh because I know wherever the fuck he is, whatever his energy is doing, and I'm not holding crystals and, like, praying to anything. I'm just hoping that he's behind the quarters. Oh my god, I just heard myself say that out loud. <laughs> it sounds so crazy. I don't even fucking care. Because to me, I know Buster would one-up my dad and laugh about it. It's like, oh, dimes, eh? Isn't that cute? Watch this. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the best advice I can give you. If someone you love and Buster, wherever the fuck you are, I hope you're smoking a cigarette and giving someone a hard time about something. I want you to know, and I hope he did know before he passed away, that I love him. Not past tense, because I still do. I just wish I would have made sure he knew, like, without a doubt, how much he meant to me. <sighs> so, the moral of the story is, what everyone tells you that's so cliche, is if someone means something to you, tell them that. It's important. 
Because I just deeply, deeply regret that I didn't write him back that day. That I went to bed instead, and he passed away after reaching out to me, and I didn't write him back. So the important thing is, regret everything. Revel in your shame. Feel badly about the things that are now out of your control. And feel badly about them for the rest of your fucking life. Okay, will do. So when your mom says to you, Why you be taking me to get electrocuted? You say, Shut up, you miserable old bitch. And be glad that someone is taking care of you. Okay? Make sure everyone knows exactly how you're feeling, what you're feeling, when you're feeling it. And then after that, just cram those feelings deep into the pit of your stomach. Because that's where they belong. Eat them. Eat those feelings. Chips are delicious. Okay. Wow, I did not think I would go down that path with you guys. That's really weird, and I feel kind of stupid. But I didn't realize that was still such a raw subject. Apparently it is. Okay, well, let's go have a little drinky-poo while the kids are still gone. Okie doke. All right, okay. Sorry, and thanks so much. Okay, thoughts and prayers, guys. Thoughts and prayers, okay. Okay, love you, bye.